uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I, I'm I, I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Connor Geerty. I am here in the law department or law faculty, or what do we call it now, David? Law faculty, law school. We aggrandize with each year. And I'm delighted to have been corrected by what we used to call the convener, but we now call the convener, the dean. So we have a dean of a law school within a school. How about that? And am I enormously pleasurable, but it turns out extremely concise uh, joy is to introduce Michael. I say concise because some of you will know Michael Zander, and he is certainly something of a micro manager. And I've had a number of emails about how long I should be. And the initial concession was that I should do a short introduction. But there was a development, which was that I should now do a very, very short introduction. The instruction that I do a very, very short introduction was accompanied by quite a long biographical note from Michael. So I'm in a little bit of a, I'm in a, a little bit of a conundrum. So I won't waste time by doing other than moving smoothly, pretending I've said it myself, to the guidance I've received. But I will say that uh, my very first week in law school in Ireland as a 17-year-old in 1975 was made much more interesting by being asked to read. Xander, Case of Materials on the English Legal System. In Ireland, we had no books. So we studied the English legal system. And, and then an altogether uh, fascinating book called The Lawmaking Process, which he's probably forgotten he wrote. So Michael Zander's intellectual engagement is imprinted on me from my first week in law school. And I'm, I'm delighted to have this chance to be here, he had long retired as an, uh, when I arrived, and I'm I'm pretty here, pretty long time. So we're 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 celebrating an extraordinary professional life, and uh, the study has been immense across a whole variety of arenas. Uh, I have especially admired his role as what is now called a public intellectual. Uh, he's writing still in the New Law Journal, still in the New Law Journal. And uh, he's an authority on criminal procedure. We, we remember that. I mean, the Xander on the Criminal Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Uh, civil procedure, legal systems, legal profession, and legal services. And I would add bills of rights. Uh, I had a very amusing interaction with Michael where I was notoriously antagonistic to rights and would try and destroy everything that Michael was writing. And he, he wrote to me, you may have forgotten this, or rang me, I think telephoned me and said, what's been going on? Because he wanted me to update him to improve the next edition of his book, which I would then attack, which was very funny. So I provided some key information, which were not lies, and then proceeded to say how poorly the whole thing had developed. But it was a very influential, shortish and readable book. Michael uh, has been a profound influence both on the law and on the practice of law and on his colleagues as an absolute paradigm. This is on, he has also invited me to say, despite me having to be very short, this is all on something he seemed to know a lot about called YouTube. And it will also not be the subject of tweeting. There is no hashtag. There is nobody in some rooms scattered around the world in their pajamas who need to be deferred to in what is now called a hybrid meeting. There is nobody who can send any questions if they are not in person. Celebrate that. They're out. You're in. There'll be a short Q&A afterwards. After Michael's uh, presentation, he'll, he'll give it its title himself. And, and then there will be, guess what, Michael again, a little film of Michael, I think he's in it, a little bit of music. So we're all looking forward to that. It lasts only two minutes. It's not an Andy Warhol six hour thing. And then you'll be given a drink and you'll be given canopies 
And also there's some suggestion there might be some hot food all in this room. So it's a huge and exciting agenda. And it starts with Michael Zander. Michael. <laughs> Thank you very much for those kind words. When Professor David Kershaw, the Dean, very kindly said that the law school wanted to take note of my 90th birthday, I offered to give a lecture. I was delighted when he agreed and feel very honored to do so in the presence of many colleagues and friends, some of whom I know have come a fair distance. Promoting change in the legal system was the title of my inaugural lecture given here in the old theater 45 years ago. I decided to revisit that topic, but with a slightly altered title reflecting a different perspective. Promoting change in the legal system, a memoir. Having reached the status of ancient, I hope I'll be forgiven for basing my remarks tonight largely on my own experience. And there is a moral in this tale. I was a law student at Cambridge for four years in the mid 1950s. In those years, nothing suggested that I might later become involved in legal system reform. We were a very docile, supine lot. After Cambridge, I had a year at the Harvard Law School, followed by a year working in the litigation department of Sullivan and Cromwell, one of the great Wall Street law firms. Both of those years, in different ways, were formative. In particular, that second year, I came to the conclusion that the American unified legal profession was in some important ways preferable to our divided profession. Those two years also changed me. I felt that I clicked into a different gear, becoming more energized, more engaged. Speaking about our two legal systems at a Sullivan and Cromwell litigation department lunch, I heard myself say that when back in the UK, I would be active in making the case for fusion of the two branches of the legal profession. My intention had been to go to the bar, but under the influence of the US experience, I thought that a practicing lawyer should be in direct relationship with the lay client, which meant being a solicitor. I gave up my scholarship and student membership of Lincoln's Inn and became an article clerk with Ashurst Morris Crisp & Co, a well-known city firm. At what was then, the mouth-wateringly high salary of 800 pounds a year. Today, the firm pays trainees 50,000 pounds a year. By far the most enlivening experience during my articles was when the firm generously released me for a couple of months or so to act pro bono as legal advisor to Tony Benn. Anthony Wedgwood Ben, as he was then known. He'd been expelled from the House of Commons on succeeding to the Stansgate peerage, but was re-elected in the resulting by-election. The election court hearing challenging his re-election lasted 10 days. Ben represented himself against my advice. It was a layman and an article clerk against two QCs a junior barrister, and a firm of solicitors. We had a strong legal argument that with the right judges, I thought, had a fair chance of success. Ben was on his feet for a total of 22 hours and never put a foot wrong. An astonishing performance. But the judges were not up for, or should I say up to, the challenge. Two years later, the Peerage Act 1963 enabled Ben to renounce the peerage, and he served another 38 years in Parliament before retiring, as he famously said, to spend more time on politics. 
My other personal experience of litigation was after I joined the LSE. Again, an unusual and high profile case. It was brought by Norbert Fred Rondell, a colorful character well known to Her Majesty's courts and prisons. On its face, his case was completely hopeless, but it raised the important question of law, whether a barrister could be sued for negligence, in this instance, for negligence as an advocate. In the High Court, Rondell represented himself. In the Court of Appeal, I represented him. Solicitors at that time did not have the right to appear as advocates in the higher courts, but instead of instructing counsel, I submitted an American-style 116-page written brief, something previously unknown here. The written brief was referred to frequently during the legal argument, but Lord Justice Dankwitz, in his judgment, said it was wholly irregular and should not be regarded as a precedent. So far as I know, it remains a one-off. The appeal to the House of Lords uh, was conducted by Louis Blanc Cooper. Rondell attended, splendidly attired in top hat and morning dress, hired for the occasion from Mosbros to show his respects. We won a partial victory, the law lords holding that a barrister could be sued for negligence, but not for negligence in the course of advocacy. It was another 30 years before they decided that barristers could also be sued for negligence in the course of advocacy. It was not long after starting as an article clerk that I realized that I actually should be an academic. Studying and writing about the operation of the system was not going to be possible whilst working in a busy firm. Also, the profession at that time was deeply conservative. My speaking or writing critically about the legal profession was unlikely to be welcomed by any solicitor's firm employing me. The obvious place to be was the London School of Economics. Jim Gower, the dean, then called convener, advised that if I was going to engage in criticism of the profession, I'd better first complete my professional qualification. Good advice that I followed. I started at the school in 1963, exactly 60 years ago, and was here for the next 35 years. It was the ideal place. The LSE is a wonderful home for many types of academic. For me, it was perfect in its location, in the lawyer and non-lawyer colleagues, and above all, for its skeptical, critical tradition. My main academic subject was the operation of the English legal system, the courts, juries, the legal profession, legal services, civil and criminal procedure, police powers, lawmaking by the legislature and the judges, process, the functioning of the working parts of the system. I used to say that my field is the pathology of the legal system. Two books for students developed out of that teaching on the legal system, 10 editions over 34 years, and on the lawmaking process, eight editions over 40 years. Their aim was to tell it like it is. Like most academics, I wrote articles for various legal journals, but there is one that has a special place in my heart. The first of, to date, 225 articles for the weekly New Law Journal was in October 1967, 56 years ago. The most recent was last Friday. My work during those years had another dimension, communicating with the general public, which I regard as a proper additional function for academics, provided, of course, they fully perform all their academic functions and responsibilities. The year I joined the LSE, I was lucky to become legal correspondent of the Guardian, a position I held for 25 years. 
Over those years, I wrote over 1,400 pieces, news stories, editorials, op-ed pieces, comments on judicial decisions and pending legislation, obituaries, whatever. I'd phone my piece to a copy taker, an early example of remote working. I never canceled a lecture or a class. That was an absolutely iron rule. Frequently, a piece or an event would lead to a radio or TV interview. That journalism and media work hopefully contributed to public understanding of the working and the non-working of the legal system. I have, over the years, both as an individual and with others, proposed a considerable number of legal system reforms. I have also, on occasion, opposed reforms proposed by others. For instance, the civil litigation reforms proposed 25 years ago by Lord Wolf, which I thought would make a bad situation worse. I was pretty much a lone voice. The proposal I count as the most useful in terms of its result, and certainly most significant for me personally, was the article in the May 1977 issue of the Criminal Law Review that led to the setting up of the Royal Commission on Criminal Procedure. The article was entitled, The Criminal Process, a Subject Ripe for a Major Inquiry. It related what had happened to the 1972 report of the Criminal Law Revision Committee on evidence in criminal cases. That report had run into such a storm of criticism that even its uncontroversial recommendations could not be implemented. I suggested that five years on, it was time for a fresh inquiry to re-examine the issues in a wider context. I itemized the principal problem areas but my main point was that the terms of reference of the previous report had been to review only the law of evidence in criminal cases. By contrast, the Thompson Committee in Scotland, which reported in 1975, had been asked to examine trial and pretrial procedures in criminal cases. I suggested that the unsatisfactory nature of the 1972 report was part it in part attributable to the committee's limited remit. I sent a pre-publication copy of the article to Roger Darlington, political advisor to the Home Secretary, Merlin Rees, and invited him to talk about it over lunch at the LSE on April the 4th. The establishment of the Royal Commission on Criminal Procedure was announced by Jim Callaghan, the Prime Minister, a little over two months later, on June 23rd. The common view is that the impetus for the setting up of the Phillips Royal Commission on Criminal Procedure was Sir Henry Fisher's report on the Comfey case, which had a much narrower focus than my article. 30 years later, Roger Darlington sent me copies of six diary entries he had made between the day of our lunch at the LSE and the Prime Minister's announcement. His email ended, it's quite clear your proposal was influential in creating the commission. The Phillips Royal Commission's report resulted in two very important pieces of legislation. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984, known as PACE, which transformed many aspects of policing, and the Prosecution of Offences Act, 1985, which established the Crown Prosecution Service. PACE, from the start, became a major part of my working life. I was involved in training police officers on the new rules before the act went live. The first edition of my book on PACE was published in 1986 as the act went live. The ninth edition was published in March of this year. I've been a member of the Home Office PACE strategy board since it was established 20 years ago. My assessment of how PACE is actually working was published last year in the Criminal Law Review. One could say all that and much more flowed from lunch with Roger Darlington at the LSE. 
The year before the article, which led to the setting up of the Phillips Royal Commission, another article I had in the Criminal Law Review triggered the setting up of another Royal Commission. That 36-page article was entitled Costs in Crown Courts, a study of lawyers' fees paid out of public funds. It ended with a call for an inquiry whether there could be better criminal legal aid services for the money, or, absurd as that sounds today, better legal services for less public money. My article was published in January 1976. The Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, announced the setting up of the Royal Commission on Legal Services five weeks later, on February the 12th. How did that come about? I'd sent a pre-publication copy of the article to Bernard Levin, the Times columnist who sometimes cast his beady eye on the affairs of the legal profession. The night of January the 6th, on a plane from New York, I picked up someone's copy of the Times and saw to my considerable surprise that Levin had used my study as the basis for an excoriating attack on lawyers. He began his article in his characteristic low-key way. Mr. Michael Zander, a person of loathsome aspect and dubious character, who spends much of his time annoying barristers, has just done it again. <laughs> that evening, I had a somewhat heated 25-minute BBC TV One debate with Sir Peter Rawlinson, then chairman of the Bar Council. The next day, Jack Ashley MP wrote to the Prime Minister, using my study as the peg, urging him to set up a royal commission. His early day motion, calling for a royal commission, was eventually supported by over 100 MPs. Meanwhile, I worked on mustering a campaign. I got the Times and the Sunday Times to write leaders and other national and local papers also weighed in. I got the Society of Labour Lawyers and the Legal Action Group to pass resolutions supporting the call for a Royal Commission. I got several legal and trade union people, including Lord Goodman, Harold Wilson's legal advisor, and Jack Jones, Secretary General of the Transport and General Workers Union, to write to the Prime Minister. And on February the 4th, I went to see the Lord Chancellor, Lord Elwyn Jones, who I was told was strongly against the campaign. I did not succeed in persuading him. But in the event, his opposition and that of the Attorney General, Sam Silkin, was neutered when it transpired quite unexpectedly that both the Bar Council and the Law Society had succumbed to the pressure. They issued a joint statement saying, I imagine through gritted teeth, that they welcomed a public inquiry. At that point, I allowed myself the pleasure of writing a Guardian leader commending their attitude. <laughs> Given the opposition of the two key ministers, the Lord Chancellor and the Attorney General, I think that the critical factor in the success of the five-week campaign was the fortuitous and fortunate presence of two good friends in crucially relevant positions. One was Bernard, later Lord Donoghue, a former LSE colleague and best man at my wedding and present here this evening, I'm delighted to say, who at the time was head of the policy unit at number 10. The other was Anthony, later Lord Leicester, who at the time was political advisor to Roy Jenkins at the Home Office. Anthony Lester asked me to send him a note for the Home Secretary, making the case for a Royal Commission on Legal Services. I hastily prepared a memo listing issues that would justify inquiry by a Royal Commission, the division of the profession into barristers and solicitors, the monopolies and restrictive practices, the effect of scale fees, the unmet need for legal services, the absence of any overall responsibility 
for the provision of legal services. As my three-page note was being typed here at the LSE, Bernard Donoghue called to ask me to send him a copy for the Prime Minister. I later learned that cabinet or the, the memo had been sent to all cabinet ministers by the Prime Minister. Or was it actually by Bernard? For the profession, the three crucial issues were maintenance of the divided profession, maintenance of the solicitor's monopoly over conveyancing, and maintenance of the bar's monopoly of the right to appear as an advocate in the higher courts. In its report, the 15-person Royal Commission said that all three were in the public interest. On the divided profession, the Commission was unanimous. On conveyancing, it divided 10 to 5. And on barristers' rights of audience, the bar won just by 8 to 7. Was the lightning campaign to establish a Royal Commission therefore pointless? Despite losing on three very important issues, I did not think so. There were over 100 recommendations in the report that I thought were worth supporting. As to conveyancing and the rights of audience, in 1985, licensed conveyances were permitted to undertake conveyancing in competition with solicitors. And in 1993, solicitors won the right to qualify for uh, appearing as an advocate in the higher courts. So in time, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on those two topics were set aside. As to the divided profession, it was obvious that fusion of the two branches was not going to happen. And I stopped banging on about it. Our divided system has great merits. Above all, the easy availability to solicitors and therefore their clients of the expertise available at the bar, both in advocacy and in all the different branches of the law. I was also involved in the third Royal Commission on Legal Matters in my time as one of the commissioners. The Runciman Royal Commission on Criminal Justice was established in 1991 in the wake of a slew of serious miscarriages of justice, culminating in the case of the Birmingham Six. Being a member of the commission was an extremely rich, intense, and rewarding experience. A royal commission is a weighty and serious way to go about reform. A lecture I gave 30 years ago about the process, the report, and reactions to the report was republished last month by the Criminal Law Review. The Commission made 352 recommendations, most of which were uncontroversial and most of which were implemented. The most significant outcome of the Commission's report was, of course, the establishment of the Criminal Cases Review Commission, or CCRC. The Law Commission is currently considering whether there's anything wrong with the statutory provisions for referral of cases by the CCRC to the Court of Appeal. In my view, there is nothing wrong with those provisions. The problem is not the CCRC or the referral provisions. The problem is the Court of Appeal, which since 1907, when it was established, has refused to recognize that its role given by the legislature includes being sometimes asked to review jury verdicts even though there is no new evidence. Section 41 of the Criminal Appeal Act 1907 provided, the Court of Appeal shall allow any appeal if they think that the verdict of the jury should be set aside on the grounds that it is unreasonable or cannot be supported having regard to the evidence. The court's deference to the sanctity of the jury's verdict is constitutionally wrong. Since 1907, the constitutional sanctity of the jury verdict has applied only to acquittals. Juries do sometimes get it wrong. The Donovan Committee in 1965 
And the Runciman Royal Commission in 1993 made proposals aimed at getting the court to act as the original framers intended. In vain, the court remained unmoved. And I am pessimistic as to the prospects of the Law Commission doing better than Donovan and Runciman. I was involved in two developments that I regard with a special satisfaction. One was the establishment of law centers. I came across the concept during a summer in the United States on a Ford Foundation grant to investigate legal innovation as part of President Lyndon Johnson's so-called war on poverty. In an article in September 1966, I recommended state-funded neighborhood law firms providing free services in poverty areas as a desirable addition to our legal aid system. The Lord Chancellor's Legal Aid Advisory Committee invited me to discuss the suggestion, but in its next annual report, the committee said it had not been persuaded, and the Law Society said it was strongly against the idea. However, in December 1968, a report by the Society of Labor Lawyers recommended the establishment of what it called law centers. The report, entitled Justice for All, published as a Fabian pamphlet, was prepared by a committee of which I was a member, and I mainly wrote the report. 19 months later, on 17th July 1970, I was present at the well-attended formal opening of the first law center in a converted butcher's shop in North Kensington. I believe the introduction of law centers is a significant development in the provision of legal services in poor neighborhoods. What impact they have actually had is currently the subject of a four-year oral history joint research project by the Oxford Socio-Legal Center the British Library, and Queen's University Belfast. The other cause in which I was especially glad to have been involved was the campaign started in 1968 by Anthony Lester, which 30 years later resulted in the Human Rights Act, 1998. I traced the history of that long campaign in the 40-page first chapter of my pamphlet, A Bill of Rights? Question mark which ran to four editions over some 20 years. Apart from that pamphlet, my main contribution was perhaps behind closed doors, helping to persuade some doubting senior Labour Party politicians. I was a member of the Human Rights Subcommittee of the Home Policy Committee of the Labour Party's National Executive. I drafted a paper which urged the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights, ECHR, into UK law. The paper was approved by the subcommittee chaired by Shirley Williams. It was then approved for publication, first by the Home Policy Committee, and then by the National Executive, not as Labour Party policy, but as a discussion document. It was launched in February 1976 at a press conference by Shirley Williams, Peter Archer, the Solicitor General, and myself. That, I believe, was the nearest the Labour Party came to support for incorporation of the ECHR until a speech 17 years later, on the 1st of March 1993, by John Smith, the then leader of the Labour Party, in which he said, the quickest and simplest way of achieving democratic and legal recognition of a substantial package of human rights would be by incorporating into British law the European Convention on Human Rights. It was gratifying to be told later that John, John Smith said that my pamphlet had helped him reach that conclusion. If one is serious about achieving change, one needs to take any and every opportunity that's offered. One such is to take the trouble to respond to official inquiries by submitting evidence and or by commenting on the report. Over the years, I submitted a dozen 
such memorandum. I was surprised when I recently looked to find that these memoranda together ran to over 800 pages. Sometimes I also sent the product to relevant opinion makers. In one instance, a then future Lord Chief Justice asked for five additional copies of my 75 page document. Is it worth the effort? I would say always. One never, never knows what will have an impact. In February 1968, I sent Roy Jenkins, then Chancellor of the Exchequer, a pre-publication of an article entitled Restrictive Practices Among Lawyers, saying I did so because the article made a suggestion relating to the forthcoming finance bill. The suggestion was that he moved to abolish barristers' immensely valuable tax exemption for post-cessation earnings from which they greatly benefited on retirement, appointment to the bench, or death. I explained that the bar was the only profession that computed profits for tax purposes on a cash rather than an earnings basis. The revenue had failed to get barristers onto an earnings basis because technically barristers have no legal right to their fee. They're paid an honorarium for which they cannot sue. This, of course, is a pious fiction. The official guide to conduct and etiquette at the bar stated, and I quote, it's a fundamental rule of the profession that a barrister holds himself out as practicing for fees and should not, in the absence of special circumstances, refrain from charging a fee. Apart from being significantly beneficial to the exchequer, abolishing the exemption, I suggested, could encourage the bar to allow partnerships. Partnerships would make it easier for the young to get started, thereby lessening the importance of contacts and private means. The abolition of Paris barristers' tax exemption for post-cessation earnings was included in that year's Finance Act. Is there some general principle for achieving system change? I think there is. It was explained by Mort Saal, the American satirist, who told of calling out to President Kennedy's motorcade as it went by, what do you want us to do, Mr. President? And the cry came back, even more. Or to put it in different terms, one should not assume that someone else will do what needs to be done. One should also not assume that the relevant authorities know about one's reform proposal, or if they know, that they'll do anything about it. One must be active in promoting the proposal by whatever means one can muster, as an individual, or better still, with others. It requires action and persistence encourage the setting up of an appropriate committee, be a member of the committee and volunteer to draft the report, enlist well-regarded bodies to give support, alert the lay and the legal press, ideally pre-publication. If it concerns government, send the material not only to the minister, but also to the junior minister and the senior officials dealing with the matter. In the internet age, the actual sending is much easier than it was before. The trouble now may be that so much material gets sent that decision makers may not actually notice what one wants them to notice. So further eff efforts have to be made. Frequently, perhaps normally, one's initiative will be resisted or just ignored. A very important rule is not to accept a reverse as final. If a proposal is not accepted this year, it may be in two or five or 10 years. One learns to take a long view. That certainly was my experience in regard to the legal profession's restrictive practices, which I addressed very critically in 1968 in my first book, Lawyers and the Public Interest. 
It took a decade, it took a decade or two, but gradually they fell away. Sometimes the passage of time in itself alters thinking about a problem. Of course, some kinds of change are easier to achieve than others. It's easier to change rules than human behavior. It was one thing to get the Bar Council to abolish the two-thirds rule, under which the junior barrister had to be paid a fee equal to two-thirds of that paid to the leader. It was more difficult to have solicitors use that change to negotiate fees related to the actual value of junior counsel's work. Likewise, the fact that the two counsel rule requiring that a QC or KC appear in court with a junior barrister was abolished did not mean that there were many leaders appearing without a junior. Academics are supposed to engage in research. In my day, empirical research by academic lawyers was very rare. But since the main focus of my work on the functioning of the English legal system was process, empirical research was obviously indicated. And despite lacking any training in social science methodology, some 20 of my pub publications were based on such research. Fortunately, the LSE's statistics department was always there to provide guidance and help. Some of the studies were conducted with students. I ran the general introductory first week course for law, law freshers. And in some years, I used a day that week to give the students a glimpse of a real life issue. At other times, I also had students from other London law schools and bar students who volunteered to take part in the study. We looked, for instance, at bail decisions by magistrates courts and found that in the great majority of cases, the court had little or no information about the accused's home, employment, family, or other relevant circumstances. That led to proposals for a system for such information to be provided routinely. Another year, pre-PACE, the students administered a questionnaire to police station desk sergeants as to how they handled requests by suspects for legal advice. The most common answer was by merely giving them a copy of the telephone directory or the yellow pages directory. We looked to see whether defendants given custodial sentences had had legal representation. Contrary to the received official wisdom at that time, the studies showed that in the magistrates courts, the majority were unrepresented. That got some attention, or at least, whether coincidentally or not, the number of grants of criminal legal aid in magistrates' courts subsequently increased considerably. At my suggestion, Justice set up a committee, of which I was a member. The committee's report, which I mainly wrote, recommended duty solicitor schemes, which eventually led to the National Duty Solicitor Scheme. National Duty Solicitor System, I should say. In the mid-1960s, it was said that our legal aid system, at that time often described as the best in the world, had basically dealt with the problem of any unmet need for legal services. A Ford Foundation supported study that I conducted with LSE colleagues, Professor of Social Administration Brian Abel Smith and Rosalind Brook, showed that that was far from the case. The study was based on structural in, structured interviews with 1,600 residents of three of London's poorest boroughs, their names randomly drawn from the electoral register. At that time, the first study of its kind on either side of the Atlantic. By far my most ambitious empirical study was the Crown Court study, which I conceived and conducted as a member of the Runciman Royal Commission on Criminal Justice. It was one of the 22 research reports published by the Commission. The study was based on Crown Court cases 
completed nationally in a two-week period, some 3,000 cases, including over 800 trials. Different, very lengthy questionnaires were completed by the judges, the barristers, the solicitors, the CPS, the police, the jurors, the court clerks, and the defendants. For the barristers, for instance, there were nearly 200 questions. For the judges, there were 89. For the jury, jurors, there were 81. We had a very high response rate, very satisfactory response rate. My 250-page report was packed with information about the working of the criminal trial system, which fed into the Royal Commission's discussions. Unfortunately, since that was before online accessibility, all that information has now been largely forgotten. Some might still be of interest. Respondents, amongst many other questions, were asked to evaluate the performance of other actors. Most were surprisingly positive. Three quarters of convicted defendants, for, for instance, thought that their barrister had done a good or even very good job. Four-fifths of the 8,000 jurors thought that the jury system was good or very good. Research can be to explore and illuminate an issue simply to enlarge knowledge, or it can be motivated by a sense that there is, or at least may be, something wrong that requires attention. Research may also be conducted out of concern about actual or threatened change. In 1970, Lord Parker, the Lord Chief Justice, announced that hopeless applications for leave to appeal in criminal cases would be penalized by ordering that part of the time spent appealing would not count towards the sentence. The news of this warning must have flashed around the prisons since the number of applications for leave to appeal dropped suddenly and dramatically. Up to March 1970, they'd been running at the rate of 12,000 a year. Within a short time of the announcement, applications for leave had fallen to a rate of about 6,000 a year, and they remained at around that lower figure. Prisoners are probably not aware that the power is hardly ever exercised. Lord Parker's statement was based on the assumption that prisoners would have received the legal advice guaranteed by the Criminal, Act, Criminal Justice Act of 1967. They were to, to be penalized for going against the presumed advice that there were no grounds of appeal. A Nuffield Foundation grant enabled me to test that belief. Interviews with 132 prisoners who had applied for leave to appeal showed that some indeed did so, despite advice from counsel that they had no grounds of appeal. But others had had no advice and some who had been advised to appeal received no professional assistance with the drafting of, the, of their grounds. The study led to a Saturday meeting in the chambers of the Registrar of Criminal Appeals, presided over by Mr. Justice Bean, at which all the relevant interest groups, including even the Home Office and the Treasury, were represented. I was there too. The outcome was a practice note issued by the Lord Chief Justice, and a guidance pamphlet issued by the Registrar. Under the new rules, amongst other changes, before leaving court, the barrister was required to sign a statement as to whether there were grounds of appeal, and if so, either to leave a draft or state that it would be sent to the solicitors within 14 days. In 1972, Sir Robert Mark, Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, giving the annual BBC TV Dimbleby Lecture, expressed concerns about a system that resulted, he said, without any evidence, in professional criminals being disproportionately successful in getting acquitted. To test that proposition, 
I conducted a study of cases tried at London's two main criminal courts, the Old Bailey and the Inner London Crown Court. The sample consisted of the number of consecutive cases that produced 100 acquittals in both courts. Sir Robert Mark was good enough to arrange for me to be given the criminal record, if any, of the 1,400 uh, defendants in the sample. The study showed the opposite of what Robert Mark had said. Although the jury would not have known anything about the defendant's prior convictions at that time, for whatever reason, the worse the criminal record, the lower the acquittal rate. Research is a vital part of sensible change, but it's not always advisable. I am, for instance, against research involving the recording of real life jury deliberations. There are various reasons why one could take that position. Mine is that I believe any potential benefit is outweighed by the danger that trial by jury might be thought not to be working well because of perceived shortcomings revealed in the process of jury deliberations. I do not think the potential benefits of such research justify the risk of reducing and perhaps undermining public confidence in the jury system. What has certainly changed for the better is the use of empirical research as a fulcrum for legal system change. Empirical legal system research by both lawyer and lawyer academics, non-lawyer academics, is now more common than it was in my day. And there are important academic research institutes engaged in the work. I'm delighted to see some of the most distinguished workers in the field here this evening. I hope it's not invidious to pay tribute to the major contribution made over the years, for instance, by Professor Cheryl Thomas. I wrote that before she told me that she couldn't come <laughs> because of COVID. And her jury, and, uh, her jury product at, at UCL, or Dr. Vicky Kemp of Nottingham University in her work on police custody. Ten years ago, the New York Center for court innovation helped to create the Center for Justice Innovation in England. In England, the English Center conducts research into how things work and how they could work better, and promotes evidence-based, innovative justice policy reforms. In 2013, the Cabinet Office launched the What Works Network, which today has ten centers operating in a variety of fields, one of which is policing. The aim is generating evidence, translating the evidence into relevant and actionable guidance, and helping decision makers act on that guidance. There should be a what's work center for the justice system. I end these remarks with warning words for any would-be reformer of systems, legal or otherwise. Written more than 100 years ago by F.M. Cornford in his 20-page gem of a book, Microcosmographia Academica, being a guide for the young academic politician, still available at a very modest uh, sum from Amazon Books. Cornford, a Cambridge classics don, described what one is likely to be up against. Addressing the young academic reformer, he warned that nothing is ever done until everyone is convinced that it ought now to be done and has been convinced for so long that it's now time to do something else. <laughs> All important questions are so complicated and the results of any course of action so difficult to foresee that certainty or even probability is seldom, if ever, achieved. It follows that the only justifiable attitude of mind is suspension of judgment. It's then only necessary to persuade others to be equally judicious and to refrain from plunging into reckless courses 
which might lead them heaven knows whither. This is relatively easy, especially by appeals to the principle of the wedge and the principle of the dangerous precedent. The principle of the wedge is that you should not act justly now for fear of raising expectations that you might act still more justly in the future, <laughs> expectations which you are afraid you will not have the courage to justify. The principle of the dangerous precedent is that you should not now do an admittedly right action for fear that you or your equally timid successors will not have the courage to do right in some future case, which is essentially different, but which superficially resembles the present one. Every public action which is not customary is either wrong or if right, is a dangerous precedent. It follows that nothing should ever be done for the first time. Well, the uh, response says it all, doesn't it? Fantastic lecture. We have, uh, we have a movie shortly. Uh, and then we have drinks and what I've learned to pronounce as canopies and possibly hot food. But we also have time for questions. And there may be observations as well as questions. And we have a hand to my left. May I ask you to say, there should be other microphones. There should be microphones heading in your direction. Possibly not. Certainly this person heading in your direction. Now with the microphone. And, and sir, if you could just say, if you didn't mind, say who you are. Uh, and that will locate you. And then it's a question or observation. And Michael, I might take two or three, if, if that'll be all right. Whatever you like. Yeah, I may forget the first two. If I, 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 I think that's extremely unlikely <laughs> on the evidence we've seen tonight. <laughs> Sorry. Um, good afternoon. Um, Professor Zander, thank you very much for a, a tremendous and unforgettable lecture. And one saw one's practicing life unrolled in front of one as you were, as you were speaking. Um, one of the things that you referred to... Could you just say, I know who you are. Sorry, you uh, you, say, you, uh, yeah, I know, but... You did ask me to do that. Yeah. Um, Stephen Hockman. Thanks. Um, and um, one of the things that you referred to was your interest in access to justice for people who can't necessarily afford to achieve access to justice for themselves. Um, uh, I speak as a former chairman of the bar and a former chairman of the Society of Labour Lawyers. And I can tell you that the Society of Labour Lawyers in particular is currently preparing proposals for the shadow cabinet uh, with a view to trying to address further the issue of access to justice, which is a perennial problem. My question, uh, which I hope you will remember to answer, is um, what your thoughts are on that point. And if you were um, invited to put forward a proposal, at least one proposal, to improve matters as they now are, what would that proposal be? Great. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you very much for, for introducing it in that way. Uh, we, we may have only one, in which case we go straight to it. We have certainly, we have a hand that is moving decisively up, and we'll follow the pattern so well set, if economical and with the name. Um, and, um, Are you suggesting the people are of a certain age in this room, sir? <laughs> carry on, carry on. Don't be diverted by me. I'll interpret. Yeah, thanks, Prince. I'll, I'll, I'll come bring you in. And it's a question that was, I have to say, on my mind, it may have been on the mind of a number of us, which is the, the difficulty of establishing a rational basis. Can I paraphrase you at a time of so much false facts? And is that a change from, from your time 
And I suppose slightly grouping it and not forgetting Stevens, were you in a golden age where rationality mattered and where politicians cared about reform, Michael? Do you think it was a one-off time or could it come back? That's me glossing the 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 mm. the point about false facts. And then we have Stevens, which we've all forgotten, but we may come back to it. <laughs> Over to you, Mike. Yeah. Um, is this working? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, well, as to Stephen Hockman's uh, question, would I uh, have any suggestions? I, my feeling about that is I'm delighted to hear that the Society of Labour Lawyers is active, as it was in my day, in preparing proposals, uh, and I wouldn't dare to offer anything except possibly say, don't forget to mention law centres, um, that we need more of them. There are only a I don't know actually what the current number is, but at, at best, at best, it was only about fifty, which is is far too few. Uh, and um, so I hope I hope that they get a mention. But when the when the report comes out, I shall be very interested in reading it. Um, as to the terrible situation which which you instance, I I mean it's it's beyond belief horrible um, that uh, that uh, I mean. And I don't know, none of us know what the answer is. It's getting worse and worse by the day. Um, yes, we did live in a golden age in that sense that we could write things and people would understand that that was actually written by us as opposed to by a, um, artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm completely flummoxed and completely lost in trying to imagine what the world is coming to in in this regard yeah thank you thank you uh i i'm i'm looking around i I'm, I'm, i i see a hand towards the end now a waving hand a determined waving hand and giving us a little bit of gender balance here i think my eyes aren't good Madam. thank you so much for a wonderful lecture michael i'm one of michael's editors <laughs> um jan miller new lord Joe. yes jan thank you for that I'd also like to ask if you have time, and I know you're very busy and just wonderfully active, could you possibly get the shadow cabinet or the next cabinet to reverse the law so that the Lord Chancellor has to be a lawyer? Thank you, Jan, very much, very much. Uh, and we might take one more if there is one there. It doesn't have to be. There's one here. There's one here. Uh, microphone coming over to... A person whom I know, of course, but who will say who she is, Carol. But yeah. let's let's wait for the microphone. Here it comes. Carol Harlow. <clears throat> for reasons that probably apply to both of us, you haven't said a great deal about online legal services. Have you anything that you could say about crowdfunding? Thank you. Crowdfunding. Carol. Yeah. Michael, over to you. Um, no, I, I mean, this crowdfunding is, is obviously a very important development. Um, I don't have anything to say about it because I haven't spent even five minutes thinking about it, except in, in passing, I mean, as anyone might, but I haven't studied the problem. Um, so I don't have any, anything useful to say, except that uh, the courts obviously are... Uh, puzzled about the business of trying to control the situation, one wondering what their role is. Recent decision is, is probably unhelpful in this regard, but um, no, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't advance any, any useful thinking on that subject. Um, uh, on the subject, Jan's question about the Lord Chancellor, did I understand it correctly that it should, the law should be changed to provide that it, it need not be a lawyer? Or that it should it, be. It, it is already. Yeah. I think it possibly was intended to be the other way around. Is, that it should be a lawyer. Well, the, the position of the Lord Chancellor, uh, I don't think there's any former or present Lord Chancellor present, so I can speak freely. Um, it was a great office of state. It was a, a, a very important office in terms of for lawyers and judges. Uh, the Lord Chancellor was somebody who was respected absolutely as being a, a powerful voice, a powerful figure, 
uh, and an important element in the whole structure. Uh, that is unfortunately no longer the case. We, Lord Chancellors come and go and hardly, one doesn't, well, one does notice them because some of them do terrible things. But um, no, the whole thing has fallen deplorably into, into a completely different state. And the, the rot set in when the Labour government uh, moved, I think it was uh, John Reid as, I was saying, I've forgotten now who, who was the relevant cabinet minister, but the, the crucial moment was uh, not Tony Blair's reforms, but the change when um, the, home, the, the Home Office responsibility for prisons was moved to the Lord Chancellor's Department. At that moment, the Lord Chancellor's Department lost its, its sovereign, uh, I mean, the, the concentration on legal matters and had to give a huge amount of its time and effort and, and, and manpower to the problems of the prisons, which dominate by, outweigh completely in terms of spending uh, what's spent on the legal system. So the legal system since then has taken second place to prisons in the Lord Chancellor's Department, Justice Department. And then we had the Blair reform um, making it open to appoint just about anybody as Lord Chancellor, regardless of their quality or quantity of, of experience in, uh, in legal matters. And since then, we've had some okay uh, Lord Chancellors and some not so okay. And um, I'm afraid that's a, a slippery slope. It would be nice if we could go back to the tradition of a great and respected legal figure being the Lord Chancellor, but I'm afraid those days are gone because prisons are now the crucial thing for that department. I mean, the, the, the major responsibility. And I, I see no hope of going back to the, to the old. Thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow an opportunity without pushing it because there are people hovering at the back preparing what looks to be a feast from here. Uh, an opportunity for, for a couple of last questions. And we have, I, I'm looking around, I've seen two hands, I think, sir, am I seeing correctly? Did you, did you want to ask one? Yes, pointing at yourself. And then behind you, there's somebody, I think. Is that right? Uh, should we take these last two? Microphones are heading in your direction. Am I right that you wanted to ask a question? Yes, and the microphone will get to you and it's now being confiscated from the, from the other person and brought to you. Remembering name and question, sir. Uh, that's difficult these days. Uh, uh, Paul Rock, a, a colleague of Michael's over over the years, uh, but a sociologist, I'm afraid. Um, I'm I'm trying to write an article presently about why it was, in my judgment, that the relations between uh, departments of justice and the Home Office with academics seem to have changed so very radically. Um, I've made overtures to the Department of Justice uh, for information about re research as a result of a commission I received to, to write for a book, and I get no reply. It's a, a black box. And my impression is that, that what used to be very cordial relations, particularly between the Home Office and the Academy, um, changed with the uh, emergence, first of all, of Tony Blair and then of John Reed, who... I describe in, in the draft article as the rope spear of new labor. Um, and I just wondered what your impression is. You talked about a history of very cordial cooperation, collaboration between yourself as an ac academic and, and policy officials. I don't know, is, is your impression the same as mine that that has absolutely collapsed? It exists elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Scotland seems to be in very favorable circumstances, but. England and Wales, it seems to me, was a terrible attenuation. And that, you know, it's no longer possible to assume that you can uh, initiate research of your own making rather than just doing set research to order, you know, on commission from, from, from uh, departments of state. Thank, thanks, Paul. I'm going to take the final question. Uh, sir, the microphone is being returned to you, and then we'll take Michael and then we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernard Donoghue, and I came to the LSE with Michael in from 1963. 
I want to thank him. He shaped many of my political views by his marvelous example of evidence-based arguments for reform. So uh, he was a great man in my life. Uh, what I wanted to add was just a few words. He mentioned the important episode in 1976 for bringing about that, uh, that commission of inquiry. Well, I was at the other end of that in number 10 as the Prime Minister's senior policy advisor and head of his policy unit. And it was nearly lost. Because I remember um, Elwyn Jones coming in to number 10, looking very agitated, Lord Chancellor, going to see the Prime Minister. And Harold Wilson afterwards told me that he had insisted that we reject this proposal because he had already promised the legal profession who had been uh, uh, sort of bantering all the while to him, but he would, and so he had to have it. And I then argued with Harold the case, and he said, get the case, and that's when I contacted Michael to send the arguments, which were brilliant. And... Uh, I put it to Harold, who was still a bit afraid of contesting the Lord Chancellor, but he came round, and then I got a message from the Lord Chancellor commanding me to his office next morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, told Harold about that, and he said, see, you just reply and command him to your office, number 10, <laughs> which I did, and he arrived. In the meantime, I'd spoken to the Prime Minister's uh, brilliant press advisor, Joe Haynes, previously of the Daily Mirror and all of that, who is still alive at 96 and phones me every, every Sunday evening at six o'clock, the phone goes, and he phones to ask if there's anything political to discuss. But he was the number one person with Harold Wilson. Harold always took his advice, and I spoke to Joe, and Joe knew of our friend and Michael, because he'd read him in The Guardian, and then I found, when I spoke to Harold, he knew all about Michael, because he was a keen Guardian reader, and he read all of Michael's stuff, and he was a great admirer. Anyway, the last thing was I said to Joe, if we set this up, we knew that Harold Wilson was resigning in six weeks. I said, if we can get him to set this up, you will have gone with him, but you will be, I will make sure, a member of the commission, which he was, of course. And we saw the Lord Chancellor the next morning and we uh, advised him that he had to restore his relations with the profession because they were not going to win on this one. And that's exactly what happened. Sorry, no, but I just thought a few things. Wonderful. That's lovely. It's wonderful. absolutely lovely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the last word is going to be from Michael dealing with Paul's and Bernard's wonderful remarks. Well, I, I can't add anything to Bernard Donahue's account, no. which is brilliant. I mean, a very nice addition to what I said. Um, as to what Paul Rock said, um, relations between academics and, and the gov government departments, um, I'm not in a position to say anything about the present situation because I sit at home um, and I don't have any, any dealings with government except as a member of the PACE Strategy Board, which unfortunately doesn't have any research capacity. So that doesn't come up, but fortunately we do have uh, Vicky, Dr. Vicky Kemp, who's doing brilliant work as a member of that committee. Um, in my day, uh, of course, I was in a particular position because I was a, not only an academic, but also a journalist. And as journalist, I frequently had occasion to deal with the civil servants, one way or another, um, over, over all sorts of things. So I, I, I got to know them, they got to know me, they knew that 
I would never ever break uh, a deadline, for example, uh, uh, an embargo. So I got fed a lot of things which um, would not have been fed to an academic, uh, I think. And so that relationship, I mean, the fact that I had two roles, wearing two hats, academic and journalist, was fortunate, very fortunate and, and unusual and, and not something that is likely to be easily repeated. But um, apart from that, I think in those days, maybe there was more uh, openness. I don't know. We have somebody here who's a senior civil servant. I'm looking at him, see whether he might add a word. Um, a very senior civil servant who might have something to say. But um, I think on the whole, it's got worse. It's got worse, um, even discounting my particular advantage of being a journalist and an academic. Um, I would guess that today relations are difficult. The difficulty of contact and getting research permission and so on is greater than it was. Yeah, it was it was considerable in my day. It wasn't easy at all. Um, but uh, maybe it's got even worse. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, I'm not going to allow. I'm not going to. He, he can't be coerced into this position by Xander's stare. Sir, uh, you don't have to do this. There is a, the right to silence no, no, is available no, no. to you. <laughs> and we need, we need, as we send you a microphone to say, this is a response to which there will be no further response unless okay. you feel extremely <laughs> impaired. Uh, and, and, and we'll go into the movie. But when you have it, sir, say who you are, if you feel free to do so. And your comment, please. Uh, uh, my name is Roger Jackling, and I'm a long-retired uh, civil servant, most of my career in the Ministry of Defence, but also in Number 10 and the Cabinet Office. Um, I think my observation would be, I was lucky enough uh, during my career uh, to work uh, for a number of uh, ministers who didn't mind engaging with the academic world or indeed any other elements out there outside of government who had useful things to say and, and the confidence to, to say them about public policy. My remark would be that I think you need to be uh, a minister of both intellectual and political confidence to welcome that debate. And I'm not sure that all of the ministers who might have been in that position have been in recent years. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. I think that stands. That's a very that good thing. That's Gosh, it. marvelous. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Michael as we end up. You want to sit there to see yourself, presumably, Probably. in the movie. Why not? Uh, the movie will be followed by, obviously, a spontaneous round of applause of some length, uh, following which you will make your own way without the guidance of the chair, who will cease to operate in about 40, 40 seconds, uh, towards the buffet behind with all of its stuff. But uh, it was a lovely thing of all the contributions here. Bernard was the end there. And he captured what we all feel about the contribution of Michael Zander. It's just one further fact that Bernard was the best man at this wedding. And, and Betsy is, I think, here. And of course, the wedding celebration, I think, was in this room. So this may be the first canopy that Michael and Betsy have had in this room since they got married. Because we don't normally have them. It's highly irregular in the Shaw Library, which anyway, nowadays, nobody can find. So uh, I'm, I'm finishing there with my gratitude to Michael and to you all for what a special evening. <laughs>